I was born in Adelaide, and as long as I can remember, I've always loved numbers and abstract games and logic puzzles and things like that. My parents told me that when I was two, I don't remember this myself, but um, uh, they, they, they found me uh, teaching some, um, some slightly older kids, maybe five or so, uh, how to count and how to spell uh, using uh, these number letter blocks. Uh, which I had apparently picked up just from watching Sesame Street. Uh, I don't remember that. Uh, the first memory I have like that was um, when I was, I think, about three. Uh, my grandmother was at home to wash the windows, and uh, I asked her to put the detergent um, on the windows in the shape of numbers. I've always liked numbers. I enjoyed, you know, as, as a kid, you know, just doing math workbooks. These were just fun to me. I had a complicated schooling. So I skipped a lot of grades, especially in math and physics. And so when I was in primary school, I was taking classes in high school. And when I was in high school, I was taking classes at the local uni. And so my mother was always driving me around. We had a very complicated schedule that we had to work with the headmasters and the head of departments and so forth. Glad my mother actually organized everything because I was not organized at the time to, to work all that out. I do math for a number of reasons. Um, there's certainly a really good feeling when, uh, when you work something out. You know, if, if there's some mathematical phenomenon, some, some pattern or some phenomenon, some, um, which you should, um, looks like it should be explained, uh, like you should know where it comes from. Um, but um, but you don't. Okay, it's, it's, it's sort of bugs. It sort of bugs me. It bugs many other mathematicians when they see something which they ought to be able to explain, but they can't. Um, and then when they work it out, um, it's like you know doing a crossword, like solving a really tricky clue. Um, like at, to begin with, you can't see how it can fit with with uh, with uh, the rest the rest of the of the puzzle. But when you see it, it all clicks. It all makes sense. Um, and that's a really good feeling. Um, when I teach mathematics, and I can see. Uh, that process in, in my students, you know, they, they, they come across some concept which they don't understand at the beginning, but when you finally explain it to them in the right way, they, they see it, and, they, and then it, it flips from being very difficult to very easy. You know, you can see it in their eyes. That is also a very rewarding experience. Once I was working in an area called random matrix theory. It's a very pure area of mathematics, and I met another mathematician who is much more applied. He works in statistics and, and um, engineering, um, and uh, he was working on the problem of trying to um, um, uh, uh, reconstruct images from MRI scans, magnetic resonance imaging scans, more, efficient, more efficiently. And you can't move uh, during a scan. So if you're scanning a lung, for instance, uh, you're not even allowed to breathe. Um, so you have to, like, um, you have to um, take drugs to slow down your breathing and so forth. It, it can be quite, uh, quite dangerous. Um, so he was interested in, um, in finding ways to, to get a good image using uh, fewer measurements to take, take shorter time. And it turned out that the, the, the problem was actually really a mathematical problem. Um, and so he had reduced the problem to so this pure math problem that he, that he, 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 uh, he showed to me. Um, he had already found some method which he thought would give um, um, a much faster, a much more efficient reconstruction. Um, like I didn't believe at, at, to begin with that, that it was possible. Um, but then we talked and we found that uh, this would actually work. And we, we, we set out a theory for it. And now, actually, it's it's uh, it's uh, it's now used all, um, uh, quite often now in, in MRI scans. Like a scan which would take two minutes can now take like like ten seconds. And so, you know, that's that's maybe um, yeah. So I, I I didn't intend it, but one of the things I did actually led to some very practical benefit. The maths that you learn in primary school and high school often is quite dry. You're given a, a whole bunch of tests and maybe a whole bunch of formulae, which it's not fully explained why these formulae work. So there's a lot of drill. You don't get to see the payoff so much uh, until you go to uni. Uh, it would be as if high school music classes were just nothing but scales and, and music theory, and you never actually got to perform. Part of it is that we don't do a good job of presenting the motivation why maths is used. You know, you know, maths is used all over the place nowadays. Um, if you, uh, you know, if, if you if, if you punch uh, your your pin number into into a, into a cash machine, how, you know, it gets encrypted uh, to, to, to be secure. How, how does that work? You know. Um, how is it that many cell phones in the same room can 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 each make make separate calls even um, even though they're sharing the same frequency and there's there's some mathematical coding behind that you know why do search engines work so well nowadays why does speech recognition work you know, these are, these are all actually applications of mathematics um, but it's not uh, often you um, you don't know um, uh, I mean unfortunately because it's, these are actually fairly advanced uh, <laughs> Uh, piece of mathematics, you, um, often you know they're not fully explained until you, you take a, college, a, a uni level course. Um, so yeah, we could do a better job of you know maybe more outreach lectures or something by by uh, uh, by, uh, by for example you know math professors and stuff explaining how these things are used in the real world. Uh, that might help. BC Fora. Yeah, so I'm going to talk actually not so much about my own work that will come up a little bit, but uh, just about. Um, uh, the, the theory of prime numbers in general, the number theory, which is uh, 
One of my favorite areas of mathematics. It's, of course, not the only area of mathematics, but it, it's, it's, um, it's, it's uh, one of the major ones. Kurt Mahler, for instance, uh, did a lot of work in, in number theory. So I'm quite honored to be giving lectures in his name. Uh, it's a very old topic. It's a very huge topic. Uh, there's no way in a public lecture like this I can tell you everything is going on. Uh, I don't even know everything is going on. Um, so uh, I'm going to just give this, this, uh, this very, very quick tour, um, the way I, I like to describe it. It's, it's like uh, visiting Paris and only seeing the Eiffel Tower in the Arc de Triomphe. You know, it's not really um, the full story, but it's, it's something. OK, so uh, but it's about the prime numbers. And just to remind you, everyone, what a prime number is, uh, a prime number is any natural number bigger than 1, which can't be factored into two smaller numbers. And so over up, up there, we have the first few prime numbers. And they just go on and on and on and on. Uh, the biggest one that we know of is, is down there. OK, so uh, we found a lot of primes. Um, uh, they've been studied uh, for a long, long time. In fact, the ancient, um, the ancient Greeks were the first people to study them systematically. Um, in fact, Euclid, even Euclid in his elements had uh, several results on the prime numbers. Um, and they proved the first two really important theorems about the primes. And that's a starting point for everything else. So um, the first thing we know about the primes is what's called the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Um, and it's, it says that, that um, every number, every natural number bigger than 1 might not be prime, but even if it's not prime, you can always factor it into primes. Every number is either prime or the product of primes, and there's only one way to write every number as a prime, as a product of primes, other than rearranging. So 10 is 2 times 5, or 5 times 2, but that's the only way to split 10 into primes. That's the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. Um, the other major theorem that they proved is called Euclid's theorem. Um, so you could do many theorems, but this is the Euclid's theorem, that the primes go on forever. There are infinitely many prime numbers. The primes never stop. OK, so these are two basic theorems in uh, Greek prime number theory. So um, the fundamental theorem that every number can be split up into primes, uh, one way to think about it is what it tells you is that the prime numbers are very important to integer multiplication. They're, um, they're like the atoms. Uh, if, if integers are like molecules, then prime numbers are like atoms. They're the atomic elements. Of, um, of, of, of integer multiplication. Every um, molecule is made up of atoms, um, you know, carbon dioxide, CO2. And simil similarly, every uh, integer is made, up of, um, is made up of primes in exactly one way. And so here are a couple of numbers and their prime factorizations. By the way, um, one, um, this is, by the way, the main reason why we don't consider 1 a prime number. So of course, 1 has no factors other than it itself. So you're saying, why, why don't we call 1 prime? Well, if we called one prime, then there'd be more than one way to split up a number in, into primes. Like the number 10 could be 2 times 5, but also 2 times 5 times 1, 2 times 5 times 1 times 1. And you wouldn't have um, a good, unique uh, prime decomposition. And so you wouldn't have the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. And we, re we really like the fundamental theorem of arithmetic. So we have demoted one, and, and we do not consider it a prime anymore. OK. Um, so Euclid's theorem is a theorem that there are infinitely many primes. And um, I, I want to show you the proof of it, because it's, it's a beautiful proof. It's uh, one of the first proofs you know, in mathematics, but it's still a, a classic. It's, 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 it's a real gem. Um, it's, a, it's what's called um, a proof. Uh, it's a reductio ad absurdum proof, a proof by contradiction. You prove something is true by proving it is not false. It's an indirect argument. So I'll just show you how it works. So you want to prove that there are infinitely many primes. Uh, so OK. Um, so. Um, so you suppose there weren't. OK, suppose, suppose that Euclid was, was wrong. Suppose there are only finitely many primes in the world, that after a while they just stop. Uh, so for the sake of argument, suppose that 2, 3, and 5 were prime, but then there are, there are no further primes. Suppose that there are, you can only find finitely many primes. Uh, then what you can do is that you can take all those primes and multiply them together. So if 2, 3, and 5 were all the primes in the world, you multiply 2 times 3 times 5, you get 30. And then you add 1. You take uh, the product of all these primes, you add one more is your new number, uh, in this case, 31. Okay, So you take all the primes in the world, mu multiply them together, add 1. That gives you a, a new number. Now, why do you do this? Uh, you do this because this new number is uh, 31, is bigger than 1, clearly. And because it was, it's one more than a multiple of all the primes in the world, it's, it's not divisible by, um, it's not divisible by, by any prime. Okay? It's not divisible by 2, 3, or 5. It leaves a remainder of 1. So we have found a number which is bigger than 1, but it's not, uh, it, it can't be divided into primes. But the fundamental theorem of arithmetic tells you that every number can be divided into primes. And so 
because we know the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, um, we have reached a contradiction. So there can't be finitely many primes, and hence there must be infinitely many primes. That is Euclid's proof. So that's an amazing proof. I mean, it's, 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 it's so, you know, it, uh, it takes a while to get used to these sort of indirect um, type of arguments. This is ABC Fora.